Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello and welcome to the 27th episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Last time we were talking about stream entry which is the first level of enlightenment in the Buddha's teaching. And we were saying, quoting from the suttas, that a stream entrant has to have four factors. He has to have confirmed confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And he also has to have virtue. In other words, these four factors are necessary for a person to attain stream entry, the first level of enlightenment, the first glimpse of Nibbana. And the point that we're trying to make here over several episodes is that stream entry is a full vision of Nibbana. It's not just a partial glimpse. It's, it's still a temporary glimpse, but it's a full glimpse of actual Nibbana. So, Let's go into this further. What does it mean to have confirmed confidence? Well, it means that not only are we uh, sufficiently familiar with the suttas that we can practice properly, but it also means that we have the experience of that practice and its results. And because of that, we are fully confident that the practices given by the Buddha have the effects that they are supposed to have, that this is a real phenomenon and it's something that's attainable, approachable by all. Actually, anyone who's conscious <laughs> is qualified to attain enlightenment. And of course, the problem is that we don't look at consciousness properly. We don't look at the idea of self or the world or any of these things properly. But as soon as we do, as soon as we have right view, then so many doors open up, so many possibilities uh, manifest that we didn't have before. And the most important of those is the possibility of the path or stream entry. So as soon as one forms the intention, let me attain stream entry, let me attain Nibbana, that is the beginning of the first path, the path to stream entry. And when one attains stream entry itself, which is a very, very profound and deep experience, unforgettable experience, then one attains the fruit of the path of stream entry. And the same is true of the other paths, um, once returner, non-returner, and arhat. The very second at that one touches up on Nibbana, one realizes this is it. This is the real thing. And after that, there's no turning back. So the Buddha is realized as the one who has perfect and complete enlightenment. Uh, that one understands the Buddha as having experienced all these things for himself. And he's talking about his own life, his own consciousness, as an example. Then he formulated this teaching into the Dhamma. Sometimes Dhamma means simply what is. But the Dhamma can also mean the teaching about what is, why it is the way it is, <laughs> and how it is. So the Dhamma given by the Buddha covers all these subjects, and it also covers the Vinaya, or the holy life, the kind of lifestyle necessary to reach these realizations. And we'll talk about that in depth later on. And finally, there's the Sangha. One should have a confidence, experience, that the Sangha, as given by the Buddha, is the correct environment, the field of merit, as it's called necessary to realize Nibbana. Now, of course, nowadays the Sangha is in crisis. The Sangha is having an identity crisis. <laughs> is uh, the Sangha reflecting the Buddha's original teaching, 
No. And this is true of almost every Sangha in every part of the world that I'm aware of. So what's the answer to this? Uh, do we really want to go back to the religious Buddhism that's like an offshoot of South Indian Brahmanism that was developed in Sri Lanka a thousand years ago? I don't think so. Or do we really want to continue with the present churchified system that was created by the British to harmonize with the Christian teachings? I don't think that's working either. In fact, in every Buddhist country in the world, young people are leaving the Sangha. They're leaving the temples. They don't have any regard or respect for the monks. They don't have any appreciation or understanding of the Dhamma. So it's not working. And if things continue as they are now, within another generation or two, the whole teaching and practice will be lost. As far as I can see, the hope is with the Western monks. The Western monks have a chance to develop a uniquely modern flavor of Sangha that is interesting and approachable to modern people, that reflects the democratic and ethical values that we have fought so hard to create and maintain in the developed countries. And despite their problems, the uh, egalitarian religious and spiritual uh, mores that lead to uh, the globalistic approach to life. In other words, everyone's belief system, everyone's uh, views are encouraged and allowed. And no one is suppressed by state power. This is a very important right, and we should fight to keep it. And I'm starting another series called Hacking the Dhamma to discuss this specifically. So I won't say any more about that now. But I will say something about virtue. Virtue means following the principles given by the Buddha. First of all, honesty, truthfulness, keeping one's word, non-violence, non-stealing, uh, and kindness, compassion, understanding so many other virtues that we're meant to practice to attain these things. Now, it's no good if we follow these things like rules. In fact, that's one of the five lower fetters that we talked about in the last episode, that the third lower fetter is being too much attached to rules and regulations and practicing rituals just for their own sake. Why are these rules there in the first place? Because People who are enlightened live that way naturally. They're naturally harmless. They're naturally compassionate. They're naturally helpful, naturally truthful. Why is that? Because they have no attachment to this world. They've already realized something beyond it. Beyond the beyond. <laughs> that is Nibbana. And because as soon as one has a taste of Nibbana, one develops detachment automatically, then it makes sense that practicing detachment is a good way to approach Nibbana. So there's the Sangha of monks and the Sangha of householders who follow these precepts. And the reason we follow them, of course, is to develop merit, punya, or subhakama, good karma. Karma that leads to further enlightenment. We go from brightness to brightness, as the Buddha says. We do good things, and then because of those roots, good things happen to us. It's also called synchronicity. That what you think about, what you meditate on, the uh, activities that you adopt reflect in your future life. So how does one attain these four factors that lead to stream entry. Let's expand the quote that we looked into at the very beginning of this part, at the very beginning of the series also. A well-taught noble disciple sees those states of feeling, perception, fabrications and consciousness as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a barb, as a calamity, as an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as void, as not-self. 
He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element thus. This is peaceful. This is sublime. The stilling of all fabrications, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. If he is steady in that, he attains destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain destruction of the taints because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes qualified to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. This is the path. So the Buddha is giving practically the whole Dhamma here. Someone who really understands the Buddha's teaching sees ordinary life, the life of the ego, the life of selfhood, as a disease, as an abnormal condition, a cancerous growth on the soul, <laughs> something to be gotten rid of by proper practice. And the medicine is given by the Buddha also. Turn the mind away from those states and toward the deathless. What is the deathless? Nibbana. Nibbana has no beginning, no end, no time, no dimension, no qualities, no activities, not even nothingness, because nothingness depends on the assumption of somethingness. <laughs> So it's not even the negation of being. It's the negation of both being and non-being. That's why it's called beyond the beyond. You see? So if he attains nibbana, it means the peaceful, the sublime stilling of all fabrications. That's called putting down the burden. Right now we have the burden of creating I and mine. And then we have to take care of them and maintain them and watch over them and go through so much unnecessary effort just to keep this I and this mind and all of the things that go along with it. So what the Buddha is saying here, this, this leads to the relinquishment of all acquisitions. In other words, we no longer think that something is mine. And because we don't accept anything as mine, and we don't accept I either, because as it's revealed in the root sequence sutta, the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, that I is based on mine. So we'll get into that in detail later on. But what I really want to get focused on right now is that if one can be steady, if one can maintain this state, for some time, he attains destruction of the taints. And there are three taints. If we can destroy these taints, then we are eligible not only for stream entry, but for non-return. So a person can attain Nibbana, or they can attain non-return, or they can attain stream entry by the intention to turn the mind away from the illusory temporary, conditional existence in the world and to situate itself in Nibbana instead. And this is the essence of meditation. So what are these three taints? Here's another quote. Bhikkhus, there are these three taints. What three? The taint of sensuality, the taint of existence, the taint of ignorance. These are the three taints. The four establishments of mindfulness are to be developed for the full understanding of these three taints. What for? Here, bhikkhus, a bhikkhu dwells contemplating the body as the body, feelings as feelings, mind as mind, phenomena as phenomena, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed covetousness and displeasure in regard to the world. 
So the three taints. Sensuality is something we've already discussed. If you indulge in sensuality, then you come to regard the body as the self, as the senses, as being part of the self, the I. And of course, this is a trap because we may be able to enjoy sensuality now. We may be young and strong and able to enjoy it in our youth. But what happens in old age? If we base our identity on these things, what happens when they stop functioning? What happens when we can no longer enjoy the senses, where the senses instead become a source of constant suffering? Or the mind, the mind becomes very agitated toward the time of death. If we enjoy this mind, if we think, oh, I'm so smart, I'm so intelligent, I have so many capabilities and skills, and then towards the time of death, we lose all of those skills, we lose all those abilities. Our mind becomes cloudy and dull. Then what? How do we handle that? How do we not become afraid and upset by that? Meditation is a kind of rehearsal for death. It's a kind of practice like a simulator. If you're going to learn to fly an airplane, practice in a simulator is very valuable because you get to experience not the exact same thing, but something very close to it that has a lot of the qualities. So meditation is like a simulator for death. You withdraw the senses from their objects. You withdraw the consciousness from the mind and direct it inward toward consciousness itself. And this is always a wake-up call. <laughs> One sees what a mess the mind is, how it's so confused and so fragmented, jumping here and there like a monkey, never resting, never still. So the taint of sensuality includes falling down into the world and identifying ourselves with the senses and the mind. The mind is one of the senses in Buddhism. Then there's the taint of existence. That means the desire for being and non-being. Let me be like this. Huh? One of the things we ask children is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And of course, because our culture doesn't support a very good understanding of being, usually they'll answer something about doing or having. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a computer engineer <laughs> or something like that. So they're talking about doing and having. They're not talking about being at all. But a state of being is, of course, the way we are in the world. So one can be a child or an adult or an old man. One can be alive or dead. One can be intelligent or not. It just depends on the kind of being that we have cultivated. And then we also have non-being. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be homeless. I don't want to be broke. I don't want to be despised and condemned by people. So we have a lot of desires for both being and non-being. And mostly we're completely unaware of them because we have no education or terminology in the field of being, ontology, or any of that. And finally, there's the taint of ignorance. And what is ignorance? Well, the Buddha defines ignorance as not knowing the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. And of course, the Four Noble Truths are the truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the cessation of suffering, and the truth of the path to sensation of suffering. And these four have to be known very deeply because as we pointed out in the last video of the first series, these four truths are the ontological roots of Buddhism along with paticca samuppada, the process of becoming. So if, as we said, the uh, process of becoming is the engine of the Dhamma, the engine of the Buddha's teaching, well, then the gas of that engine is the subhakama or good karma that we create by actions in terms of the virtues. And so we're out of time. So we'll continue this discussion in the next time uh, with more about the path leading to Nibbana.
Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta